because there's no risk. I, I don't think that is true. If you have somebody infected with the virus in the rehearsal room or on stage in a performance hall, you can bet other people are going to be infected unless everyone is following very careful protocols. Tom Duffy asks, uh, Mark, is there any evidence that musicians... Right. I'm sorry. Is there any evidence that musicians and ensembles have had higher incidence? Yeah, I see, I see Tom. Okay, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, it's interesting, uh, Tom. That's a great question. And uh, I've, had a few, I've had a few discussions over the last number of days that um, as we look back upon infections through our ensemble, and maybe, maybe anecdotally we can all uh, uh, think about this, it seems as though when some of our ensemble members get sick, like one person will be out from rehearsal, and then at your next rehearsal, four people are out, it seems like anecdotally that a lot of those people are woodwind players. And that may be due to the fact that their instruments are producing more aerosols than others. So if you think back to some of the, uh, maybe in your careers, when you have had incidences of large numbers of students in your ensemble getting sick, it, it perhaps is uh, woodwind players, the people up front in our ensembles. And, um, okay, Greg is saying it's brass players. So, all right, well, anecdotally, I, I've had that conversation. It's not, not really a way to prove it at this point in time, but we can watch for it in the future. Um, but the suspicion is that because woodwinds probably produce more aerosol, they're in proximity to other aerosol producers and more likely to get sick. No way to prove that at this point in time, and we're not going to use real subjects to test this out. So. Thanks, Mark. Kimberly Roof asks, um, upon, uh, with the spit and water keys, et cetera, can we assume sharing instruments will not be recommended? And um, we, the recommendation that we made in our document was to not share instruments. And if you absolutely had to, that um, they were thoroughly sanitized to the highest standards possible. Uh, we realized that that makes things difficult in many situations. Um, but that's, that's the safest thing, is to not share instruments, at least for the time being. And one of the things we've been batting around at my university is what are we gonna do with all the instruments that are currently in storage? that have been played in the last few months, will we just assume that they'll be okay in three months from now, or do we have to do a full disinfection of every instrument that was played? And if so, who's gonna pay for that? So those are unanswered questions, but important ones nonetheless. I think uh, based on the current knowledge that the, uh, the virus will not survive more than a few days, uh, so if you've had an instrument in a case for three months, um, I think you're going to be okay. Here at Clemson, I'm going to have uh, some students disinfecting our entire inventory just to be on the safe side. And I'm paying that out of, our, out of my own band budget, just some work study students to come in starting June 15th. Um, so if, if you can't do that, um, I don't think you're going to get the virus by playing an instrument that's been sitting. I just worry about the perception. But my lawyer says that I can't say that. Yeah. My lawyer says that I can't say that, so I'll, I'll take that back. Mark, a couple of people have asked about the CSU study. Can you give us an update on that? Um, we have a, a meeting with the two, the two groups tomorrow morning, uh, the, the Colorado Boulder and the Colorado State University. So uh, I can't really say anything before that meeting happens, but I'll, I'll know more tomorrow. Thanks, and Cody was asking, Cody Birdwell, if we know anything from the choral world. I can tell you our committee was, um, was consumed with, with uh, the band world. So we didn't investigate that at all. But Mark, you've been on top of the science of this. Have you heard anything beyond that pretty depressing Nats uh, webinar? Well, yeah, the CDC came out with a report on the uh, uh, Skagit County Choir, the, the church choir in Washington State. 
And uh, they came short of saying that the aerosol was a uh, um, spreader of the virus, although they said it was, uh, you know, it could have played a role, which is basically hedging their bets. So I find it unlikely that pinch points um, would cause an 80% infection rate uh, because we saw this duplicated two other times. There was a, a choir in Amsterdam, the Conservative Bow uh, Chorus, and also a choir, I believe, in South Korea, which had 80% infection rates. We've never really seen 80% infection rates uh, that I'm aware of before this uh, COVID-19 issue. So I find it highly unlikely that just sharing, you know, surfaces that might have been contaminated with droplets, an 80% infection rate is very high. It seems to me that, that um, it's more likely that the aerosols were spreading this than any other specific activity that this choir was engaging in. Thank you, Mark. All right, still trying to keep up with the questions here. There are lots coming in and that's great. Um, I was asked privately about the forums next week if they're gonna be essentially the same. And I'm sorry if I wasn't clear about that. Essentially, yes. It's not likely we're gonna know much more next week than we know now. Um, but uh, there might be different questions asked and therefore there might be some different dialogue. But essentially, we're just trying to open up the door for dialogue about either the science studies that Mark's been heading up or our document um, itself. So are there any questions that we haven't gotten to from the chat that I may have missed? It looks to me like we're caught up, but if we're not caught up and you put a question there that I didn't see, would you uncue your microphone and then just go ahead and let's, let's hear your question? So uh, this is Brian um, and I'll start my video too. Um, it sounds to me like we can assume there is and has always been an increased risk of spreading any virus by playing an instrument or singing with others. Um, once the data is in, how do we evaluate and who evaluates the threshold for accepting any increased risk like this? Well, I, I should, I've been telling people too that, that um, these decisions to go back into the classroom, the rehearsal room, are not going to be ours to make ultimately. And I hope you all realize that. It will be federal, state, and local authorities who make that determination. And if, if your local or state or federal authorities are saying that you can't have banned, we hope to be able to provide some good scientific dat data that says, okay, we can minimize the risk down to X percent, and so we should be uh, just as able to go back into the class as this other class that's going back. So if, you know, what, what we're trying to do is advocate for our profession here, but ultimately these are not our decisions. They'll be made by uh, other, other people, but we, we're doing this in order to inform the science so that you can take something to your administration uh, you know, but, but more than likely, you know, I think in the state of South Carolina where I live, I think the governor is going to be the one deciding and then possibly the president of my university who, who I'm in contact with. So if you don't have a relationship with your administration at your school, now's a good time to make that relationship so that you can advocate for your program if and when these decisions are being made and if you're not being included in the conversation. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Brian, for that question. Uh, Jim Latin has a question, and, and I want Jim to actually ask that question. But before you do, Jim, would you um, share with, with the room the document that you've just shared with me we're going to try to make available to everyone? This is a wonderful resource that Jim has put together. Could you let us know about that, Jim? Oh, sure. Sure, sir. Certainly. Uh, Jim Latin, Juniata College, Central Pennsylvania. Uh, 93 degrees here. Uh, good afternoon. <laughs> um, yeah, I talked with Robert about, uh, he had mentioned something about uh, a lot of us are music and um, flex uh, instrumentation and things like that. 
just after the Rodney Winther book came out 10, 12, 15 years ago, uh, I think resource, um, I, I read through the book and I realized, boy, this would be really great if there were an Excel spreadsheet that uh, had columns and rows and, and for each piece, what does it need? How many basset horns does it need uh, in a sortable fashion? Uh, so I did that. And uh, so there's an Excel sheet, not only of everything in the Winther book, but I've added some other things to it as well. Robert and I are, are talking about some ways that that could become uh, viewable by everybody. So that's in process. Thank you for that wonderful resource, Jim. And then um, Jim was asking uh, you, Mark, will either Colorado study look at how much aerosol and or condensation will stay on music stands? Should we have every student bring their own stand and put away the column stands? I, I, I can speak to the last part of that. Our committee recommended that every student bring his or her own stand to every rehearsal and they share, share nothing. The, the less that they share in common, the better. And I'll let Mark speak to the science part of that. Yeah, I think, I think in terms of uh, viruses and bacteria, uh, you know, the, the disinfection methods are pretty well known at this point. So if you, you know, if it's just going to be up to you probably in your own situation to make those decisions. If you have a disinfectant spray that you want to spray the, uh, the music stands down with, what we're going to be looking at in terms of aerosol remediation are barriers in front of high aerosol producers. So that may, one of the things we'll probably look at is some kind of material on a music stand that's right in front of the player. So again, no matter what happens, just assume that by the end of rehearsal, anything and everything is contaminated the music stand, the cloth hanging over the music stand, the, the, the thing where the droplets are going, you know, if you have a container for each brass instrument, just assume it's all contaminated and it all has to be disinfected. So uh, if you're going to use the school music stands, you just have to assume that after a rehearsal, they're all infected and have to be disinfected. So the, the idea of having the players bring their own is it puts the responsibility for their stand with them instead of with you. I, I, that'll give me an opportunity to talk about one of our recommendations that has raised a few eyebrows, and that was that um, to the extent possible, the musicians stand in rehearsal rather than sit. And um, I, a few people have asked questions about that. One of our colleagues said it was the silliest recommendation he'd ever seen. But the reason uh, that recommendation was made was exactly what Mark just said, that anything that gets touched or anything in the room, it's going to have to be disinfected. If it's stacked in a separate room, if those chairs are stacked somewhere else, then that's something that doesn't have to be disinfected. And uh, at least one member of our committee, uh, that's gonna be their policy uh, in the fall if everything stays as is. And I've heard at least one other university saying they're gonna head in the same direction. So that's just a chance to explain why we were, uh, why we were doing that with that recommendation. Uh, let me see. We're other questions in here. Uh, Tyson Wooders asks, um, will the research look at how ventilation affects the aerosol hanging in the air? Would a robust HVAC outflow minimize risk at all? Mark, that's right in your wheelhouse. Yeah, and I, I did tell uh, Tyson in the chat that, that we would be doing that. That's really more of phase two, and that really will depend on your own rehearsal space and what the HVAC system, the, you know, the, the the quantity of air that it is moving per hour, um, it's, it's gonna be based on what your room can do. So this would be a good idea, you know, a good time to get with your facilities folks and get that da data now so that when we do, uh, you know, get done with this first part of the study or, or the second part that you can apply it to your own space. Yeah, or other spaces that a band might fit in if your HVAC system isn't any good and that'll make the difference. Yeah, and I think until further notice, uh, you know, I've said this before in some of the other Zooms I've been on, um, my plan is to rehearse outdoors until, until we have some really good science behind everything. And that includes my symphonic group. Um, you know, luckily I have a courtyard right outside our band room and weather permitting, permitting we're just gonna go outside and rehearse out there uh, because we do know that, that being outside um, is a much less, likely situation to spread the virus. 
uh, Cynthia, would you um, speak to Peter's question? Because I see you answered it in the chat. So why don't you go ahead? Uh, this is Cynthia Johnston Turner, everybody from the University of Georgia. And uh, she's replying to a question by Peter, uh, Peter Martin. Yeah, Peter is is um, giving us some information about uh, basically copyright. Just be careful if, if we're going to go to virtual uh, situations that we are cognizant and aware of all licensing and copyright. We, we did address that uh, in a couple of places in the document, but I think that that's um, a good idea and important to reiterate here. So thank you to Peter. And Robert W. Smith mentioned um, talking to some publishing companies about offering rights for various uh, types of projects in these extreme circumstances. And I don't actually recall the details of that, but it may have spoken, he may have been speaking about uh, virtual performances as part of that. Um, there isn't a lot of public domain music for us, but um, as we mentioned in the study, the Holst Suites are in public domain, uh, English Folk Song Suite is, uh, most Sousa marches, lots of great chamber repertoire. So there are things in the public domain that we can do. More questions. If we haven't gotten to your question in the chat, feel free to go ahead and put your microphone on, identify uh, who you are and go ahead and ask. There's a question from John about um, logistics, locker, storage space, ingress, egress. No, we're not going to look at that in the science study that we're working on, but I think it would be good for you each as individuals to think about how you can um, deal with large numbers of people coming in and out of your space. So I've already begun to think about our space and I'm going to have entry and exit points uh, where, which are one way. All right. So we're trying to avoid people coming you know, a lot of large number of people coming at each other. So everything's going to be one way. We're going to try and keep everybody six feet apart and um, keep the flow moving so that there's minimal contact between the students while they're inside the building. Uh, so, so the answer to your question, John, is no, we're not going to look at that in the study, but I think I'm already thinking about my own space and, and coming up with a plan. And I would encourage all of you to do the same. Thank you. Craig asks about percussion. Do we require students to bring their own accessories, triangle, tambourine, wind chimes, no changing parts at all? I think to the extent possible, yes, they, they should stay on an instrument. And I, pedagogically, I, there are a few of us that would say that that's an ideal situation. But um, I, we're, we're, we're facing something we've never faced before. And unless things change dramatically between now and the fall, we're going to have to think very carefully about what we want percussionists to do. Um, it, it, it speaks to the whole sharing of instruments idea. Um, there's a lot of programs where people have to share instruments, and, and we don't have a good answer to that, unfortunately. Uh, the best answer is don't. <laughs> and if you have to, just disinfect them to the highest standards possible. Uh, there's a link in our document to many articles about disinfecting uh, that would hopefully be very helpful to you. Privately, someone asked me about uh, marching band uniforms, and um, we were asked only to look at the concert side of things. Barry Hauser, with his athletic bands committee, handled uh, the athletic band side of the house, and uh, I know they're still working on their document. Mark, do you have an idea of when their document is going to be released? Will it come out soon? We, uh, we had the virtual athletic band symposium coming up Thursday and Friday. So I, I would encourage you, if you're involved in athletic bands, to uh, sign up for that. It's free, uh, being offered by, uh, through CBDNA. And Barry, you know, he's just a wonderful colleague, and he's put this whole thing together. So most of the sessions on Thursday and Friday will have to do with, uh, you know, how, how do we deal with athletic bands in this current situation? And they will certainly be looking at all the information that comes in Thursday and Friday and then uh, adding to their report. Now for, for um, when, I, when I got to Clemson, all the uniforms were stacked and racked after the football game in our band room. And I, I stopped that practice many, many years ago. So I make the, the students take their instruments home. And so I, I, their uniforms, I'm sorry, uniforms home. 
and um, I'm just thinking through my mind, let's say a person is sweating in their uniform uh, and we can assume the uniform is now infected, they're taking it home with them, uh, which is a better place for it probably than in a shared space with a lot of people. So that's a great question. I'll make sure that Barry uh, knows that, uh, that this is something we need to look at. And knowing Barry, he's already thought of this. So um, more, more information to come from, from the Athletic Band Committee. Uh, Frank Trace from uh, K-State asks us, will medical style gloves help the percussion situation? That's a great point, and perhaps they could. Um, I've seen a number of articles uh, about how using gloves still can create cross-contamination, um, but it would certainly keep the anything contaminated off that person's hands. So that's definitely something to consider. I wanted to mention, I know Mark mentioned at the top, and we mentioned in our document, that our document is a living document. This is such a fluid situation that we're going to be updating the document maybe as often as every couple of weeks. As we get suggestions, when we get a group of them, we'll meet as a committee, either virtually or well, <laughs> either through email or virtually, and uh, decide uh, what updates should be made. So at the end of the document, there's a link to a Google form. Feel free to throw anything in there uh, that you think should be added to the document, and we will absolutely consider it. And uh, I'm taking notes here as well, so that may be helpful. Robert? Yes, sir. Can I answer the question on the gloves a little bit? I, I know that uh, Tom Duffy isn't here and he's, he's got a, a good medical background too, but if you think about gloves, uh, they're really no better than bare skin unless you're trained to use them. If, if you think about a doctor who's scrubbing up for surgery, you know the last thing they do is put on their gloves and they hold their hands away from their face. And of course their face is all masked up anyway. But if you put gloves on and you have no mask, and you wipe your nose like this on your, on your gloves, it's, it's no better or worse than just having your bare hand, right? So if, if you can train your students that if they're wearing gloves to keep them away from their face, then yes, they'll, they'll do some good. But if you can't do that, they're, they're not gonna do any good. Because the first, the first time somebody does this, you're, you're done. Those gloves are contaminated. So I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it keeps it off your own hands, but that's what I had mentioned about cross-contamination. It does little to keep it off of the things that you're touching. Other questions, please go right ahead. Feel free to unmute and just ask. Hello, Mark. This is Jerry Gatch from right down the road. Hope you're doing well. Um, has there been any talk in either of the phases of this uh, research about ultraviolet ray emissions and things? Um, our, our department chair, said that you know this technology has been around a long time and, and may be something that could be put to use. Are they gonna look into that? Yeah, we're, we're not actually going to study the UV lights because it's, it's well known that UV lights at a certain spectrum do kill viruses. The problem with UV lights is it's very expensive to retrofit a space with the kind of lights that you need. Um, you know, in the potentially tens of thousands of dollars. So. It's not practical enough, and it certainly would not help our secondary schools and middle schools whatsoever. It might condemn them to not being able to rehearse at all. So we're not really gonna study the UV light situation. That, that's well-known science already, uh, but if you wanna look into it, it's out there, and I have some articles and studies in my Google Drive folder that uh, you know, I think is being shared around. So, uh, in order for that to work, the air has to be brought to the ceiling up to where the lights are, and they have to be hanging around these lights for a certain number of seconds in order for the virus to be neutralized. Now, this is why outdoors is going to be a, an effective model, is, is uh, sunlight is going to kill the virus fairly quickly. Not only that, but the ventilation is a lot better outside than it is going to be inside, unless you're in a wind tunnel uh, rehearsal room. Thanks. Any other questions? Feel free to unmute and go ahead and ask. I want to be sure to reiterate that um, we're, we're making um, 
suggestions with our document and um, you know we don't know what's going to happen in the fall we're, we're we're making a best guess based on information from dozens and dozens of people to whom we've spoken uh, but we're, we we are not dictating anything nor can we and as Mark pointed out that's going to be dictated by state and local and, and university officials um, certainly not by us I just wanted to make sure to mention that again uh, William um, is asking, can ozone generators help, Mark? Um, to be honest, I haven't, uh, I haven't seen a lot of research on ozone. Uh, I've seen a little bit, um, but I'm imagining that in, a, in an indoor space, it might not be the safest way of neutralizing the, vir the virus. Um, believe it or not, Lysol spray may be more effective than, than some things. Uh, but, but all of that is, is science that exists elsewhere. Um, and again, it's, we're, we're going to try and look at solutions that don't cost a lot of money. And I'm not sure how much a, an, an ozone generator would cost or what the other issues. Um, if you have any scientific studies on that, please feel free to send them my way. Bruce Moss has a question, Bruce. Bruce, are you with us? Uh, your microphone is muted. I'll go ahead and unmute you there. Are you there, Bruce? Yeah. Uh, yes. Can you? Uh, actually, I don't have a question. Somehow it must have popped in. Sorry. Oh, that's all right. All good. Nice to say hi. And greetings to everyone. <laughs> greetings to you. Robin Bell, you have a question. Let's hear Robin's question. Hi, Robin. Hey, Robert, good to see all of you, and the many, many pages of all of you. So uh, I'm in Florida in a very unique situation where a uh, very highly cultural arts centric area. We have about 850 people that come to our concerts. Um, maybe different from some of you in the college arena, but you know, there's the discussion is about the rehearsing and about the, the music for our groups. But the question I'm getting from my administration is more like, from the audience perspective, and what do we do about getting people into the performance hall for these, if that's even possible, you know, taking the temperature of every audience member, distancing them, only allowing perhaps 200 you know, versus 800. So has, did the team talk about the, the audience patron uh, aspect of any of this? I didn't see it in the document. Yeah, we only, sp thank you, Robin. We only spoke about it anecdotally because uh, truth be told, it's not anything that's in our control at all. We, I, most of us are not gonna have any say over what the social distancing guidelines are gonna be for particular spaces. Um, I'll let my other colleagues on the committee speak to that if they wish, but I'll, I'll mention one thing that uh, our percussion faculty member and I are in the process of investigating pieces that were specifically written for outdoor performance. And we've already identified a couple, one of which by uh, G Gabrielle Olivero, what? was actually written to be performed on a college campus outdoors. Um, so we're looking at uh, unique and different situations like that. Um, I, I, beyond that, I can only speak personally. I'm expecting no traditional performances of any kind for the fall. Uh, I just don't think we'll be in that situation. Maybe a performance to a, an empty hall that's live streamed. Um, I have no knowledge that anybody else doesn't other than what I gained from being on this committee, but that's just at, at our university, that's where our head is, that we're gonna create experiences based on process more than product um, and try to investigate doing things that we haven't been able to do in the past when we were product oriented for, for better or worse to say that. Cindy or Jason or Alex or Gerard, would anyone like to speak more to that at all? And I, I would say maybe an additional appendix to that living document would be um, this list of outdoor oriented pieces that you're speaking about. Um, unfortunately, my entire funding comes from ticket sales. So I'm in a bit of a quandary on how to monetize live stream yeah. things. But we're working on it. We have some Patreon and Vimeo and some other things that we're going to work on. So thank you. 
Robin, did you see the well-written article about the Boston Symphony Orchestra and what they would need to do in order to break even? They basically fill a quarter of the, their hall and have to charge four times for every ticket. It, 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 yes, I, I saw it and, and wept, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I think that that was one of the better articles, and um, I, it, it doesn't paint a, a great picture. Um, I, I'm seeing just anecdotally, just reading things, but many concert halls are just saying, there's nothing for 2020. We're just not even going to try. And I can tell you this, we had tickets, my wife and I had tickets to Hamilton for May. They moved it to September, and then we just got an email saying it's now September of 2021. They just, they just gave up and said next year. So I think that's, um, that may portend something, uh, possibly. I, I can just sing all the songs for you here if you like and <laughs> save you a lot. <laughs> Thank you. We'll pay you the, what we paid for them. Uh, we're, at this point, we're just going to actually probably get a refund. It's so far out, it's hard to even know what's going to be happening then. So um, Some things were flying by in the chat, and I haven't caught all of them. If there are any questions, go right ahead. We've got about 10 minutes left. And I want to reiterate the, uh, the other sessions that will happen next week will be run basically the same. Uh, we'll answer questions. Mark will give any updates he has on the science. But if different questions come up, there may be different answers uh, for that reason. But, uh, but you shouldn't feel like you're going to miss something if you don't come to all three sessions. We just wanted to offer a variety of times to people. I have a question. This is Lauren Reynolds, University of Delaware. Hi, um, and I have a question. Hi. Um, following up, um, Mark, you were talking about the study being about one minute and then sort of extrapolating out and, and that there would be an algorithm for figuring out then the, the risk level or whatever beyond there. Is that already, does that already exist to know how to calculate that out? Because time is, you know, one of the major factors in this. So I'm just curious if that exists or if that's going to be like a second phase of it, figuring out how to move on from the one minute. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. Uh, we're we're going to test all the instruments. <clears throat> we're going to have an excerpt uh, play that's about one minute long that covers a uh, wide range on the instrument and also a wide range of volume. So it sort of mimics perhaps what about one minute of playing will produce. And from that point, it's just, I think, I'm at, again, I, I, we'll have to get the scientists on this, but I think it's just a matter of, um, you know, if we know a trumpet produces this much in one minute, times that by however many trumpets you have, times however long your rehearsal is, minus what the HVAC system is moving, you know, how much air it's moving. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, we'll, we'll have something uh, more useful than what I just said, but that's, that's the basic premise. Thank you. Uh, David from Bemidji State has asked, uh, has anyone identified strategies for holding honor bands or festivals in an online fashion? These events are crucial to recruiting and fundraising. Uh, we did not discuss that in our committee, although I have seen one called the Bandwidth Festival. Cynthia, aren't you involved in that? And, and I mention that only because if, if, he, if he, the person who's running it, is doing it, perhaps it's possible to mimic that model in other places. Am I right to say that you're involved in that, Cindy? Yeah, when this all went down back in March, I was contacted to see if I wanted to be um, a lot of the bands across the country who had who had already uh, paid money and were going to do their spring uh, evaluations and other concert festivals. Was there something that we could do to help these bands still perform? Uh, and things were, it's Greg um, Charest, I'm not sure how to write, C-H-A-R-E-S-T is the person who contacted me. And um, they've, I think that he's run into uh, some logistical issues, some licensing issues, uh, just issues. So I'm not sure where that's at right now. Does anyone else in the room have any thoughts about honor bands or festivals running in a virtual manner? There are 176 of us, maybe someone else has an idea. Okay, hearing none, then I will move on. And I'm gonna make a note about that um, because I think that's a really great question. Uh, making a note here. I've got one quick thing outside the box, um, which is to consider the honor band experience, even if you can't play. 
I know it's weird, but you could still give them a valuable experience that would connect them to your program, get a chance to meet each other, uh, pr provide some of the usual functions, even if there's not music involved in the same way. Thanks for that, Tyson. Onsby Rose asked quite a while ago, and I didn't get to it. If um, Mark, this question will be for you. Uh, for those who conduct orchestras, can they assume that a string player will be emitting the same amount of aerosols as just a normal person talking? Well, the great thing about string players is they can wear a mask, which we know uh, is, is a mitigator of the aerosol, especially if you're the one who has the virus and you're wearing a mask, that is going to prevent a lot of the spread. So um, <clears throat> I would say, you know, there's going to be less aerosol produced in an orchestral situation if you have everyone that can wear a mask. Thanks for that, Mark. I did want to mention if we are in a fully virtual uh, situation in the fall, one of the recommendations or suggestions from the committee is that we, we find activities that hit in one of four places. And I want to reiterate this just in case it got buried in our jargon and in the, the long document. We, we had recommended that we want activities that either teach to the normal objectives that you would have for your rehearsals and ensemble uh, or for your ensemble, or teach musicianship or refine musicianship, or teach or refine ensemble skills, or help to build community in some way, either on your campus, within your school or department of music, or within the greater community. So we made you know, dozens of recommendations, but there are probably dozens and dozens more. Uh, but we think if, they, if you can hit on one of those four places with each of your uh, activities, you have a good chance of being able to make a strong case for why we're gonna need to continue doing what we do uh, in a completely virtual setting, should we be faced with that. Okay, I'm reading over in the, um, in the chat. Robin Bell has another good question. Is this affecting anyone's scholarship offerings to your students? Is anyone seeing a lower enrollment of your ensembles? Um, I'm sure some are and some aren't. Uh, someone made a suggestion, I just can't remember who it was at this point, maybe it was Brian Lamb, that um, we should lobby to make sure that anyone on a performance-based scholarship keeps that scholarship, even if we're not meeting, because those that will help keep a student at the school. Um, I can tell you what I've done at Georgia State is we've identified for every student who has said they're coming to the School of Music next year, we've identified a current student to be a Zoom pen pal with that person to keep in contact with them and to try to keep them excited about coming. Our, I can only speak at Georgia State. Our numbers look great for next year, but we're expecting melt way more than we've ever seen in August when the rubber hits the road. We're expecting that a lot of students are just gonna say, music, if we end up online, music is not an online thing, we're not gonna come. Uh, does anyone else have anything they wanna say about that one way or the other in terms of ways that they're uh, scholarships are being impacted or suggestions for how to not lose scholarships or recruiting type suggestions. If you have something, just go right ahead and unmute your microphone and, and go. So Bob, this is Cody Birdwell. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, sure can, Cody. How are you doing? Yeah, so all our scholarships are good. Uh, you know, they're being retained for the students and they are not at risk. Uh, there's no way to anticipate how many students may opt out at this point, like you just mentioned. But one thing we're going to do in the band, uh, through our band program, is uh, do a monthly newsletter starting June 1 to all of the new students and to the returning students just to reassure them that we are here, that we are uh, looking forward to starting up in the fall, even though things may be different. And I think the point is just for us to reach out directly to the students, communicate uh, to them as faculty members and as their conductors that we are here for them, and that being uh, reassuring to them and to their parents might be of some help and uh, help retain uh, the numbers a little bit more. Thank you so much, Cody. Any other ideas uh, about recruitment or scholarships? The floor is open. Yeah, I'll add something here. Hi, everyone. Gerard Morris, University of Puget Sound. Um, thanks for joining us today. 
you know, one of the things that I found here, and we actually, um, our yield is still coming in our deadline here. Uh, like I know some other institutions was extended to uh, June 1st for admitted students. And we've actually had a really good yield this spring. And I think part of it is that I helped the faculty and we, we sat down and we're like, yes, we're feeling anxiety. Um, there's stress about the future. There's a lot of unknowns. And if we project all of that onto these families, then they're going to be less likely to want to move forward. They're going to feel stuck. So my marketing and, and my, my approach, my leadership is that you can be part of the solution or you can press pause on life. And so come to Puget Sound and be part of the solution. And just that kind of like hopeful messaging has made a huge difference in giving people like, oh yeah, it's life. This is temporary. We just don't know how long it's going to be. And everything we're doing is to ensure that we can continue to learn and grow together and be part of a community. And these students are grabbing onto that and being, yeah, I want to be part of that solution. I want to come to school. So it's been very helpful. Thank you, Gerard. Anyone else who has anything to say on that, if you wouldn't mind just dumping it into the chat. And everybody, you, you should have the ability to save the chat um, with the three dots uh, down at the bottom right-hand corner of your window. You should be able to save the chat there. Uh, Tom Duffy brings up a good question, and I just want to tell Tom and everybody else that I'm going to try to get an answer about this. Can we broker our numbers and buying power and get others involved to request that copyright holders, publishers, make concessions as exceptions rather than as precedent for online distribution of music and performances? I'm sort of suggesting that we unionize. <laughs> um, I, again, I know Robert W. Smith has, has spoken to some publishers, big publishing houses about that. And I will find out, I will get an answer to that and I will post it in the um, COVID-19 Facebook page. And if anybody who is not, our CBDNA COVID-19 Facebook page, if anybody's not a Facebook person, just go ahead and shoot me an email and I'll make sure that you get that information as well. We're about a minute over time here, but it's there still are some questions in here, and I want to just see if I can get to the last couple. Um, does anyone know, Tim Marr asks, an application that, given the dimensions of a space, could plot the maximum number of spots to place musicians while keeping a set distance between each member. Uh, I know that Mallory Thompson at Northwestern University got the exact dimensions of her rehearsal room and accounted for 60, 36 square feet per person. That would keep everyone at a six foot distance in every direction. So I don't know if there's an application to do it, but if we take what we keep hearing as a, as a recommendation of six feet, 36 square feet would do it. And I think you could probably figure out the math. Is there anyone among us who knows a more sophisticated or easier way to compute that? Okay, we'll leave that there. John Pasquale from Michigan says he will be doing a session at the Athletic Band Symposium regarding virtual recruitment processes. So um, we can catch that on Thursday and Friday. The uh, Virtual Athletic Band Symposium will be all day Thursday and Friday. Mark or someone from Athletic Band Committee, where's the best place to access a schedule for that? Is it on the CBDNA website? Um. Actually, Barry has not released the schedule yet, but if you registered for the symposium, you will get an email either late morning or early afternoon tomorrow. And how do you register, Mark? Uh, Barry sent out an email to the CBDNA uh, membership. It's also on our Facebook page, the CBDNA Facebook page. Uh, it's got a nice, beautiful graphic that his uh, team made it uh, it's got a football field a green football field and the cbdna and it's very colorful so just look for the real colorful photo on on the facebook page yep thank you peter martin uh your point is well taken about robert smith that you know every publisher is going to handle things differently and every piece is different um and i think we all understand that but i know he has spoken with some some big publishing companies uh unless i'm mistaken it's been kind of a drinking out of a, a, a heavy hose here for the last few weeks. So I'll, I'll get clarification on that uh, and try to uh, try to pass that along to everybody. Okay, everyone, well, we're about five minutes Chandler, over. Yeah, Mark, go right ahead. Uh, Chandler just posted the 
Yeah, Chandler just posted the uh, link to the to sign up for the Athletic Fan Symposium. So it's in the chat now. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, I know some of us have meetings coming up uh, immediately, so I want to make sure that we don't go uh, any further over than we are now. So uh, unless there's any final business from Mark or any of my colleagues from the committee, anything to say? Gerard? Yeah, yeah real quick. I just want to let everyone know I've been getting a lot of email messages from um, uh, our, our membership about I'm not getting these emails or those. And I just want to remind everyone, if you log into the CBDNA website, um, on the left side of the screen, it'll say you can, like manage your um, uh, manage your uh, um, your stuff there, and then you just click on list serve, and then there's a bunch of boxes that you can check. And if you don't check those boxes, you're not going to get this information. And might, this might be a good time to check more boxes than fewer if you're interested in knowing what's going on in the athletic realm, if you're interested in knowing what's going on with the small uh, college band programs and whatnot. So just be, please be aware of that. Thank you, Gerard. Anything else? Cindy, Jason, Alex, Mark Speed? I just want to yes, please. I just want to toss in our great appreciation to you, Robert, and you, Mark, for the amazing leadership in all of this. The, the committee, the people who've served on your committees are in awe. So thank you. It's our pleasure. It takes a village, everybody, and um, you all made it made it easy so thank you thank you Alex for the kind words and also for your, your wonderful work uh, I want to remind everyone that our document is a living document and we really do mean that if you have any suggestions especially anything that may have popped into your head as a result of this meeting go ahead and look at the, the, the document at the end you'll see a Google form and go ahead and fill that out and we will meet regularly to discuss those uh, items that are placed there uh, if you want to save the chat, which is chock full of some great information, just in case you don't know how, click on the three dots and hit save chat, and then you'll have a text version of that for yourself. Uh, Brian Doyle reminded me about 10 minutes into this meeting that I wasn't recording it, and then I started recording it. Sorry for not remembering, but uh, we'll find a place to post this probably on the Facebook CBDNA COVID-19 page uh, or perhaps somewhere else. I'll speak to Mark uh, Speed about that. So we should have that posted soon. Um, our next two forums uh, will happen next week. Uh, and please feel free to stop in again if you want. Uh, those dates are June 2nd, 4 to 5 Eastern, and Wednesday, June 3rd, 2 to 3 Eastern. So my great thanks to my committee members, our committee members, to Mark Speed for his great leadership, and to everybody else for tuning in today and being part of the solution here. We'll get through this together. And as we said in the document, there's no manual for what we're going through. We'll, we'll figure it out. So thanks to everyone and all the best wishes. Stay safe, stay healthy. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much.